Well, good morning again. I'm glad you're here, and it is exciting to gather this morning. It was great to start the day with baptism and prayer and just some time to pause in the midst. I know we all face crazy weeks. It's just a moment of reflection to say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I know I need you. So that's why we come, and I'm grateful you're here. And as I thought about this morning's passage, John chapter 6 is where we're going to look at if you want to be turning there. As I thought about this morning's passage, I remembered a situation I had with uh, athletics, and I've already confessed openly about my lack of athleticism, but I do remember there is one sport that I found enjoyable. I didn't say I was good at it. I just said I found it enjoyable. It was ultimate Frisbee. Anybody played ultimate Frisbee before? All five of you, I see. Great. Well, there's a reason why, right? Uh, It's kind of some weird combination of football and soccer with a Frisbee. Yeah, it's It's as weird as it sounds. It really is. But we had it going here at Valley View for a little while, a long time ago. I got playing with some guys. It was a great time uh, for a guy who's less than optimally athletic and a great time to hang out with other guys. And I became very familiar with the game. Not good, just familiar. I knew how it worked. I knew what to expect. And so uh, when I started working in college ministry, we had this training in Florida went to this college there to get our initial training. And the group's called Campus Crusade for Christ. And there was just the college side, just working with college students. But then they also had an athletics ministry, Athletes in Action. You may have heard of that group. They used to do scrimmages with UofL. They probably don't play them now because UofL might have lost. We won't go into that. (coughs) I'm a UofL fan, so I don't know why. But here we are. It is what it is. Back to my story. Athletes in Action, they were getting training as well. And us less than athletes were being trained as well. And somebody heard that I liked Ultimate Frisbee. Some other guys did that. We were playing that here and there. One of those guys said, we want to challenge you to a game. And I knew they didn't know anything about Ultimate Frisbee. They just were assuming their athleticism would beat ours, which normally would be very true. They had been beating me up on the basketball court all week. So I leaned over to these other guys and I said, we are going to trounce them. We are going to destroy them. It's going to be so great. I've never had this experience before in my life. They think they're going to beat us, but they have no idea what they're doing. And of course, we get out there on the field. We're throwing the Frisbee around and we're scoring and scoring and scoring. And these guys are yelling at each other. They're mad at each other. They're trying so hard, but they don't know the game. But there comes this point in the game at about the probably like fourth quarter, start of the fourth quarter time period, where I lean over to the other guys on the team and I'm like, guys, this is the moment of truth. Okay, this is the moment where if we let up, This is where teams come back. So we can't let up. We got to see this thing through. We got to stay focused, keep driving forward. You know, this is the one moment in my life to have that speech, okay? So, and they're kind of like, okay, John, whatever. You know, (laughs) you need to lighten up a little bit. It's ultimate Frisbee. We're Christians. We're Christians serving in ministry. We're being trained to go, like, forget all that. We got to win. We got to see this through. We got to trounce them. And I got thought thinking about that reality of there are moments when You need to keep pressing forward. You need to keep the gas on. You need to stay engaged just when you think, I've got it. I'm all good. Everything's clear. That's the moment to keep the gas on. As we look at this passage today, I think we're going to be presented with this question at the beginning. Will Jesus do that? We're going to see a series of questions. This is in John chapter 6. And so we get a question from the Jews and Jews in the book of John is often used as a term to describe the religious leaders of the time, those who were antagonistic towards Jesus. So when I use it, I'm using it that way. It's not the only way it's used in the book of John, but it often is used. Jews come with a question and Jesus responds. Jews come with a question and Jesus responds. And in this back and forth, you wonder, their questions are definitely focused on doubting him, on questioning him on undermining him. How will Jesus respond in that moment? Will he keep the gas on? Will he keep the pressure on? Will he keep pushing forward with who he is? Or will he back off, let up? There are times to do both. How will he respond in this moment? So let's turn together to John chapter six. And if you have a church Bible, we have the page number for that up on the screen. Those church Bibles are available for you. If you don't have a Bible, we wanna put one in your hands. Those are free for you. We want you in God's word. But John chapter six, we're going to start by looking at verses 41 and 42. John chapter six. 
So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Now, as a brief reminder, the setting here is that Jesus had just fed the 5,000. Jesus had walked on water. He went across the lake. The crowd came after him to find him. And they had a conversation last week. We talked through all that last week. But now this conversation is continuing. In fact, it seems to be narrowing in on this group who would be the unbelievers in the crowd. Those, there are plenty who don't really understand who Jesus is, but they're following him. And then there are those who are there because they don't believe in him. They maybe want to undermine him. Maybe they do sincerely want to know more about him. But this is who he seems to be addressing here real specifically. And the very first thing that's mentioned about them is this word grumble. Grumble. The Jews are grumbling about him. Uh, That word simply, very clearly also just means complain. They're the complainers in the crowd. Everybody's favorite person to be around, right? The complainer. No, those are the people we, we run from. We try to avoid. We, want to, we don't want to be anywhere near them. Now, there's two sides to this issue of complaining. There's the fruit and the root. We want to look at both sides of it. The fruit is the obvious outward side of complaining. What are they complaining about in this moment? What is this issue that seems to be bothering me that's causing me to complain? That's the fruit side. And here, it's pretty clearly their view of who he is. It says they grumbled about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Makes a bold statement. But we can't accept that because is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say this? How can he make this claim? It's a pretty bold claim. I have come down from heaven, but he's just, we know, we know where he grew up. We, we know his mom and dad. We know where he's from. Nothing special about him. And how many of us have made the mistake of judging things just on their surface? I know I've done it. I did it this week with someone, probably more than once. One time that I'm obviously aware of. It's such a temptation. Now I already know everything I need to know about this person. I know everything I need to know about this situation. I know where they came from. I know their parents. It's one of the great challenges I think we all face, especially in, if you get into any conflict, if you get in, in between two people who are experiencing conflict, you hear one side of the story and you think, oh, this other person's clearly evil. They might be the son of Satan themselves, according to this person. And then you hear the other side of the story and you realize they feel the exact same way. And where's the truth in that? It might be somewhere in the middle. It might be off in the atmosphere, somewhere completely unrelated. And so we've got to wrestle with and struggle with putting aside, I think I got this all figured out. I think I know it all. I think I completely understand the situation just based on appearances. That's part of the challenge we're facing here is that they're grumbling, assuming they know everything there is to know here. Second though, that's the fruit. But underneath that, is the root. What is the root of this complaining spirit? Many people fall into this pattern of complaining and sometimes they don't even realize they're doing it. Sometimes they don't even know why, but there's this this spirit of complaining, this root of complaining that has been built up in their heart over time. And until you know why that is, until you know what it's at the root of that, that's not going to go away. You can stay, you can say, stop complaining to yourself all day long. And it's not going to take care of it until you deal with the root of what's going on. In fact, I had a person share with me this week. Every time I'm quoting this person here, every time I'm around my mother, she reminds me that I can do nothing right. This is an adult. Years and years and years of every experience with my mother, you can do nothing right. Who wants to be around that person? What's going on in her mother's heart that feels like that's what she needs to emphasize with her child? Side note, parents. (laughs) I don't know why it is, 
Something about parenting makes us feel like my job is per- to be your personal corrector with our children. My job is to point out all the ways you've messed up. Let me just give you a challenge this week, even especially with your adult children. Just say positive things for one week. See how it goes. And if you're thinking, well, there's nothing positive I can say, <laughs> then that might be an issue with you, not them. There is so much incredible power, and I don't mean empty positivity. I'm not talking about making stuff up that you don't mean. Don't do that. Find something that you can be positive about, that you can reinforce. Just do it for a week. See what God does through that. There is so much power in that. There's a friend of mine, Jeff Kemp. He lives in Arkansas. Got to know him there. The name might be familiar to some of us more um, seasoned people in the crowd. His father's name is Jack Kemp. Jack was the Secretary of Urban Housing Development under President Reagan. He also was a very accomplished pro quarterback, multiple NFL, uh, well, it wasn't NFL yet, championships, pro football. And here's his son under that shadow. And he's not as accomplished of an athlete, but he's trying his hardest. He's playing football. He's going through the motions. He's working hard. And his dad would say to him all the time, Jeff, you're doing great. Jeff, you're in there. You're doing, you're doing what you need to do. You're putting in the work. Your time is going to come. Keep putting forth the effort. You're going to show up. The coach is going to put you in. There's going to be a time. And he was always third string, fourth string at the end of the list. But then senior year would be a starter. Goes to Dartmouth, same thing. Third, fourth of the list, not a real big football school. Ends up starting, makes it into the NFL. Plays 11 years as quarterback, going around to different teams. He's got so many amazing stories. But he said, what kept me going through all that is my dad over and over again. Jeff, you're where you need to be. Jeff, keep putting in the work. Jeff, God's going to use you. He's going to open the door. The time's going to come. How much more powerful is that than, well, you know, you, you're just not quite tall enough, Jeff, to make it. Your arm's kind of on the, it's okay. We'll see. Keep giving them positivity. Push into them. Press into them. Not empty. Not empty words, but words that breathe life into them. But why do we end up with this complaining spirit, this grumbling spirit. What's at the root of this? Well, we're going to see later in the passage, Jesus is going to draw this out real specifically. Here we see the grumbling. and Later, we're going to see why. So the very first point here, I said there's a question, interaction, question, interaction. The very first point, the Jews come to him and they grumble. Grumble. Now, the question is, how does Jesus respond to this? What will he say in response? What will he say in response to their grumbling? How will he help direct them to the reality of who he is? That's a big piece of what's going on with the grumbling. They don't want to accept who he says he is about himself. They don't think he has the authority to make such a claim. We know your mom and dad. How can you say such things? What gives you the right to do that? You know, when we first started renting out our parking lot to Ford so they can park some of their cars there and we can receive some benefit from that, I heard from so many of you and each one of you thought you were the first person to think of it. Hey, do you have trucks for us over there this Sunday? You know, (laughs) and I tried to think of some witty way to say, By the way, if you give a large enough gift to the fellowship hall, we'll pick out your own truck. I could never come up with a good way of saying it without it sounding too baiting. Now we have the money raised. I can say it, sort of. I could say that all day long, though. But I'm not Oprah. I don't have any authority to hand out those trucks or cars or whatever is over there to you. And they're looking at Jesus going, what's your, you don't have any right to make the claims you're making. So how does Jesus respond to this? Look at verse 43 and 44. Here's his immediate response to them. Jesus answered them. Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me 
draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. As it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. So I love how he responds here. He doesn't even engage on their issue of, we, we know your mom and dad, we know who they're about. He doesn't even go there. He goes immediately, immediately to the greater reality. And he uses a powerful word here. Verse 44, no one could come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And so that's his response. That's our second point. The Jews grumble, the father draws. The Jews grumble, but in response to that, the father draws. Now that word draw is going to take a minute for us to unpack because it can be used a few different ways. And I'm going to run through a couple of different verses where that same word is used. And as you know, in any language, a word has a range of meaning. It can be used in a variety of ways. It can be translated a number of different ways. And so here's just a few of the ways this word draw, which translated as draw here, it's also translated other ways in a couple of other verses. So look a little bit later into John chapter 21. John chapter 21, that's John chapter 6. John chapter 21, verse 11. If you put up that verse as well, if you have it. Well, if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. John chapter 21, and I'll read it. It says, Simon Peter went abroad and hauled the nets ashore. So instead of draw, that same word here is translated as hauled. Next verse is in Acts 21.30. If you have that, go ahead and throw that up. Acts 21.30, then all the city was stirred up. The people ran together and they seized Paul and they dragged him out of the temple at once. The gates were shut. Dragged him out of the temple here. Elsewhere in Acts, they drug him out of the city. So we've got hauled, we've got dragged, and then in James, there's one other place where it says, are you not the rich ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? So we've got hauled and dragged. They drag you into court, they drag you out of the city, out of the temple, hauled in the fish, all against their will. None of those situations were positive. There's one other verse, though, it's really interesting where this word is translated slightly different. Look at James 1.14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. I love that word lured. It points to the reason why we translate it as draw here. And of course, the setting there is sin. And if you think of the power sin has to lure and entice you to the very place you don't want to be, how much more powerful is the Spirit of God to draw you toward him? And the reality is we all need that. Every one of us needs that. Our study in Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What can a dead person do to save themselves? Nothing. Nothing at all. And that's the state we're all in, of spiritual deadness. Unless the Father draws them, they cannot come to him. We love him, not because of how great we are at loving, but because he first loved us. It's critical that we never forget that. Don't ever forget where we came from spiritually. We need to walk with a huge measure of humility. The only reason any of us know Christ is because others have come around us, come alongside us. God has used other people to guide him to us. If he hadn't done that, where would we be? Where would you be? You'd be dead in your sins and transgresses. And so he draws. Now, the question is, he draws us, but how does he do that? He says right here in the following verses, he, the father draws us, but how does he do that? Look here in the next couple of verses, verse 45 and 46. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone who has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. What Jesus does here is he quotes Isaiah 54, 13. That's this verse in verse 45 is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. It's interesting that the they, if you look back in Isaiah, it says the children will all be taught by God. And the context of Isaiah there is the restoration of Jerusalem. Try to put ourselves where the nation of Israel would have been at this time, oppressed, led by a foreign power. Parts of their 
styles and approaches to worship would have been minimized. Parts of living out what they felt was God's law in their lives would have not been allowed. And they had a history of oppression and slavery. But the passage in Isaiah says there will be a day. No more tears, no more pain. There will be a day when all things will be made right. And Jerusalem will be a place where even your children will be taught by God himself. In fact, one commentator said, do you, do you want to know how he draws us? The equation here is through the teaching of his word. God has drawn you to himself. You just kind of pause a second and think about the power of this. Through his written word. But as important has been other people taking the time to invest in you with his word. Other people have said, my life's not about me. I can spend it however I want. I'm going to spend it pouring it into someone else. Every one of us could go around and point to people, probably many in this room, who God has used through the teaching of his word to draw you to himself. Sometimes it is more of a drag or a haul, kicking and screaming when you didn't want to. But he drew you lovingly, graciously, compassionately. Because it doesn't work to just drag them in against their will. I'm thinking of my friend, Jimmy. When I first met him, he was just kind of going through the motions. He even proudly confessed to me, I, I made it through college without ever reading a book. I was just there to get my basketball degree. That's why I went. Never even finished a book. He's proud of himself for that. He didn't realize I was secretly judging him for that, right? <laughs> no, sort of secretly. But it was amazing to watch him. There was a day where everything, the lights just came on for him. And in a moment, he had been there. He had been in church. He had been in the atmosphere of Christ at work. And every, in a moment, everything changed. It was so awesome to see that God drew him and it was gracious and compassionate and in his timing and his life completely changed. He went from going through the motions to showing up to on fire for Christ. How can I serve? How can I also pour into others and tell others what God has done in my life? That's how it happens. And Jimmy didn't step back and go, you know, I finally was finally smart enough to figure it out. Finally good enough for God to accept me. Finally got there. Way to go, Jimmy. No. Even he knew. Not because of my own works. Not because of anything I've done. That Christ drew me into himself. So he draws. He draws us carefully. And he draws people in through teaching. And to summarize this really radical idea, he makes two points. Look at verse 47 and 48. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. He goes and restates the very point he had made earlier. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. In fact, Tim Keller said this is like, pardon the pun, it's like a bread sandwich. Slice of bread, verse 48, slice of bread, 35. But in the middle, he said, is grace. The grace is those verses of 37. All the father gives me, he will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out the grace, the grace of him drawing us to him. And so he repeats this reality, which when we're trying to answer this question of what does Jesus do? Does he keep the gas on? Does he keep the pressure on? In this moment, he doesn't back off. You know, I'm sorry, I'm upsetting you. Let me dial it back just a little bit. No, he just repeats the same back to him. You didn't hear it earlier. I'm the bread of life. I am the bread of life. The other thing he does is he takes it up even further. Look at verse 49 and 51. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. 
He goes beyond just saying, I'm the bread of heaven. He even equates it with his flesh in this moment, continuing to just notch up the challenging statements, the challenging words, the challenging ideas. He's not backing off with them. They're grumbling. God is the one who draws, and Jesus continues to press into their misunderstanding of it. Now, how are they going to respond to this? What do they say in response to him continuing to press? Continuing to press. Look at verse 52 for their response to this. So we went through the first question and response. Now we're into the second question and response. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? The call for them, he is saying, is to eat my flesh. Eat the bread from heaven, which is my flesh. And they disputed among themselves, how can he do this? What gives him the right to make an even more bold statement? It's really interesting here that it says the word disputed. That's really far too mild. Some translations might say quarrel. You know, I don't often use that modern English. Desist from your quarreling. You know, what one at least says is fight. This straight up makes it. A vicious argument up to the point of fighting, up to the point of now we've lost control, which it's fascinating that when Jesus makes a bold statement, it turns them more against themselves. In the midst of wrestling with this, it turns to more infighting, more frustration, more anger towards one another. And what this illustrates, their response, their grumbling, they're disputing, they're fighting. What this illustrates is a pattern that has been going on in the legacy of the religiosity of the nation for generations. In fact, we're going to take a quick journey over to Numbers 21 because the issue here is that the Jews fight. That's our third point. Jews grumble. Father draws. Here, the Jews fight. But flip with me to Numbers 21. That's around page 100 in your church Bible. I think the page number's on the screen, 119. It's near the front of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, fourth book of the Bible. Numbers chapter 20, look at verse three. Start with verse two. Now there was no water for the congregation. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people quarreled with Moses. Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought us into this wilderness that we should die here? You get this quarreling spirit, this complaining spirit, this grumbling spirit. In fact, a passage we've already looked at together is in the next page over, chapter 21, the bronze servant, serpent, verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. The people became impatient on the way. Okay, side note about that. Speaking of the Asbury revival, the most powerful story I've heard of that, about that this week. My parents went and they waited. They wanted to go in. I know some of you went as well. They waited outside in freezing temperatures, wind blowing for three hours and 15 minutes to go inside. And they said there was no complaining. There was no grumbling. Everyone was building each other up, engaging, excited to go pray together and worship together. And I thought, man, just that same day, I complained about waiting three minutes in the line inside a store where it was comfortable, where I was buying something for myself. You know, how dare they make me wait? Who are these people in front of me? Grumbling complaining, impatience. Here it's exposed. The people became impatient on the way and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no, fa no water. We loathe this worthless food, the, the food you give us every day. We do nothing for it. Complain, complain, complain. It goes on into how he brought judgment on them. And all of this points to this spirit of, of quarreling, of unbelief that had been happening for years and years and generation after generation. And this goes back to the root issue of the complaining. 
I said, there's a root issue of complaint at the beginning. What he's exposing here at the end of the day is their lack of trust in God. At the core of their complaining, at the core of their grumbling, is a lack of trust in God. Which is hard to hear, by the way. So yesterday when I'm complaining in line waiting three minutes, there's just a an element of a lack of trust in God. An element of unbelief in that moment. An element of my time is more important than anyone else's. There's an element of I'm more important than what God might be doing anywhere else. And it's the same thing at play here. You can't be who you claim to be because we don't, we refuse to believe. It's hard to hit upon. That's hard to realize. But what's powerful is how Jesus responds to this. So their question was, who could this be? Leads to them fighting. Now look at how Jesus responds to this. Our final response here together. Look at verse 53. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He doesn't back off at all. He keeps pressing pressing more and more. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I'll raise him up on the last day. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, I in him, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. You know, he does something here. Oftentimes we've seen in the book of John, when Jesus is talking about some physical symbol, there's confusion. Uh, Whoever drinks of my water will live forever. The lady at the well is like, what are you talking about? There's water here. Give me that water. I don't understand. You must be born again, Nicodemus. I, how do you do that? I don't understand. I can't go back into my mother's womb. Confusion. But here there wasn't. Even at the beginning, they knew that when Jesus was talking about bread, they said, how can he come down from heaven? They knew there's something. He's, he's hinting at something greater at work here. He's not just talking about physical bread. There's something else. We don't fully understand it. That's why we're asking questions. We think he's making claims he doesn't have a right to make. But here he keeps pressing it on. In fact, he paints the picture even more grotesque to them. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And even though they knew this is metaphor, it still would have been incredibly offensive. I mean, it's offensive enough to you to say to drink any blood. That was off limits. But to say someone else would say you drink my blood. He's crossing all kinds of lines here. And what he's doing is he's painting for them the picture of where to find real life. In fact, he does, makes four points here. When he talks about feeding and drinking, there's just four quick points in this big section. Number one, verse 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, the result of this will have eternal life. This is where you find eternal life. Number two, verse 55 My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. These things point to a higher reality. The bread, the food, the drink here doesn't ultimately satisfy. But there is one that will forever. True bread, true drink. Third, look at verse 57. As the living father sent me, I live because of the father. Whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is where you find real life. This is where you will live is in him, in his flesh, in his blood. And then lastly, it says, and this is a key to his response to the Jews in the audience. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. It's not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And so he makes a contrast here again between your fathers in the wilderness, eating manna, eating the bread. That bread came down from heaven, but they died. Now, 
It takes a second to just step back and ask a couple of questions. What does all this mean? What is he talking about? What does this mean for us today? How do we eat his flesh, drink his blood, and not eat the bread that your fathers ate in the wilderness? Here's what the bread was that they ate in the wilderness. It was this understanding that the law that came down from heaven to us, if we keep that rightly, we will be accepted by God. If we follow that, if we do what it says, if we keep the laws. But his point here is where that leads is death. That doesn't lead to real life. And what Jesus says is if you want to know real life, you eat my flesh and drink my blood, which is for us at the end of the day, it all comes down to the word believe. That's a picture of what it means to believe him. In fact, we have a real physical representation of that that we get to participate in today. This isn't a passage outlining outlining communion, but it is pointing towards communion. And so, deacons, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss you now so you can get the elements ready because we're going to take communion together, representing the step of faith to say, Jesus, when your body was broken, you died for me. When your body was broken... Your blood was spilled out for me. And I'm going to trust that over my own ability to follow the law, to come after you. That's the picture that's painted in communion. In fact, I've been reading a book by one of the uh, Duggar girls. Do you remember this TV show that was on for a while? They had like 19 kids and they kept feet. Well, it started out with 14. And then there are like 15 and counting. They had to add the word and counting. Each time, finally at 19, I think they had the word, but it didn't go beyond that. But they, it was like a reality show. They followed them around. And one of the girls wrote a book about her faith journey after that. And she doesn't do anything to beat up her family or any of that experience. But what she talks about is her own journey of, for her, she doesn't use the word, but it was a legalistic faith. And she realized, I thought real life was found in the length of my skirt, and in what I did or didn't listen to, and whose teaching I followed. But no, she came to find out. In fact, she wrote a book, Growing Up Duggar, with her other sisters, and she said, the one thing I realized I left out of that book was Christ. You want to find real life? And for her, she says, that whole approach was exhausting. It left her completely tired and exhausted. And so my prayer today, and go ahead and start passing out the elements, men. My prayer today is that you would find that life in him. In fact, you'd be free from that exhaustion. Free to walk in him and the freedom of knowing him. The way we practice communion is that if you know him, if you have accepted Christ into your life, if you follow him, if you call him Lord, then you're free to participate with this. Go ahead and take a cup. There's two cups stacked together. One has the juice, one has the bread and Have those ready and just spend some time in prayer and we'll take them together in a minute. I'll lead us through taking that together once everyone has those. But just spend some time in prayer, praying and ask God. Because daily, this activity is the daily reminder we need to believe. The eating of his flesh, the drinking of his blood. Just spend some time in prayer now. The fourth point in our outline was that Jesus offends. He kept the pressure on. Eat my flesh. 1 Corinthians 11 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup, it's the new covenant in my blood. My blood poured out for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In fact, we say to him, Lord, we believe. We believe. Let's take the juice together. God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you that your body was broken on our behalf. 
that your blood was poured out so that we can experience forgiveness from sin. And I pray today and all throughout this coming year that we would experience freedom in you, freedom from sin, so that we would be fearless to proclaim the gospel. Give us the strength to do that, Lord. Give us wisdom. We love you. Amen.